Hello everyone, Paul Martin here, and this is the situation for March 31, 2020. Thank you so much for joining. I have tried to put together a series of videos over the last month to educate people, to hopefully assuage any concerns that you have, to empower people, to make good decisions, and prepare them for what may be coming down the pike. This video is not going to be an upbeat video. If you have reached your tolerance of bad news, this is probably not one that you want to watch. Feel free to close out at this point. Hit the unlike button, dislike button, if it makes you feel better. You're not going to hurt my feelings. But at the same time, for those of us who are interested in being prepared, I think it is incumbent upon us to know everything that may go wrong, even if it is somewhat remote. I want to get a few things on your radar moving forward so that you can make better decisions in the next two weeks, four weeks, five to six months. As always, I'd like to remind folks to check out the website, paultmartin.com. Click on that Ready Citizen tab there at the top. Lots of information on how to get better prepared, free manuals, free PowerPoints, free spreadsheet, lots of great information. And I really appreciate those of you who have read through the material and have taken time to reach out to tell me that it is helping you get better prepared. I'm glad that you are finding this helpful, particularly at this time in our nation's history. I am uploading information as fast as I can uh, in that resource tab that you see there, lots of different uh, items, including uh, blogs and uh, articles, websites that I go to on a regular basis for news and information. I'll be working on this over the next few weeks. Continue to check it out, paultmartin.com. And I am pleased to report there's lots of interest in the preparedness lecture series that Carl Wren of KR Training was able to put together with his team. Go check it out, vimeo.com. Do a search on PTM preparedness. The pricing allows you to choose one video, two videos, or the entire uh, eight hours. I said in the previous video it was 12 hours. Carl, correct me, it's only eight hours of material. But there's lots of information there. Hopefully you can learn something and learn from the mistakes I've made over the years, save you some time, save you some money. Check those videos out. Paul T. Martin, Preparedness Lecture Series on Vimeo. I alluded to this at the beginning. This is not going to be an upbeat message. If this sort of thing bothers you, these topics that we're going to be discussing bother you right now, I don't blame you if you say, you know what, I just can't handle it or I can't handle it right now, I'll come back to it later. I, I totally get it. At the same time, these are things we need to talk about to have a full spectrum analysis of what may be coming down the pipe. I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about those four items you see there. Potential, and I do emphasize the word potential. Not saying these things are going to happen. However, there is certainly a number of experts who are talking about this, writing about this, commenting on this. I think it is worth our time to have it on the radar as part of our analysis moving forward. That includes disruptions in the food supply, growing food insecurity, the potential for civil unrest, and the potential for increased crime moving forward. So what you see here is a snippet from the Dallas Federal Reserve's survey that they just completed. And by the way, everything I talk about will be linked below. You'll see this if you pull this document up. I believe it's on page 7 of the document. They send this survey out, and they, it was designed for the COVID-19 situation to various e sectors in the economy for the states served by the Dallas Federal Reserve. That's going to be, I'm doing this from memory, but I believe that's New Mexico, Texas, uh, and Louisiana. What was really interesting was this snippet uh, that was sent to me, and I had to like hunt around and, and find it on the Dallas Federal Reserve's website. This was tweeted out uh, by someone who monitors these things. These, what you see here, are bullet points from people who are in the food manufacturing industry who have sent in comments in response to the Federal Reserve Survey of the Dallas branch of the Federal Reserve. You're starting to see now people express concerns in the food manufacturing sector about potential disruptions in the food supply. Now, what's really interesting here is 
this comment about the workforce remains happy, as does the raw material supply chain. I will share an article here in a moment that may color that uh, perception just a bit. But what I found interesting here is that the shift in demand to packaged food is quickly depleting the finite supply of packaging material. So what this commenter is saying is it's not that there's not enough food, it's the packaging material. People are not going to restaurants now. They are eating more um, from home and they are getting it from grocery stores. The packing material we use to pack food is not as available as it used to be. Um, this is uh, the, the challenge that they are reporting. Uh, also note this comment here from someone who was interviewed in the survey. We are experiencing supply chain delays and disruptions. Folks, this is the first I have heard of this. I saw this yesterday afternoon. I did a little more research. Um, this is not uh, a one-off thing. Apparently, this is we're starting to see other reports of this here and there. Case in point, CNBC headline, coronavirus hits already struggling U.S. farmers. We've stopped saying it cannot get worse. This was published, I believe, over the weekend. A couple of quotes here from that article. Now the coronavirus pandemic has dealt another blow to a vulnerable farm economy, sending crop and livestock prices tumbling and raising concerns about sudden labor shortages. Those of you who have been following the news over the last year know that the trade war with China has really impacted negatively uh, the agricultural sector in the United States. Further reading from the article, but panic is surging as more states shutter businesses and in order people to stay mostly indoors. Consumer demand for items like beef, chicken, and fish have dropped as restaurants close indefinitely. More people are opting for cheaper non-perishable goods like pasta and beans at grocery stores. You may be tempted to think, well, as long as the pasta and beans are there, we're good. The problem here is that the ag sector, like a lot of other sectors, there is a lag time in terms of spooling back up. If you are, if we are consuming beef and chicken, it's not like you can just flip a switch and all of a sudden have beef and chicken back in the pipeline, back in the stores. It takes a while to grow those animals. It takes capital investment to grow those animals. And if, if that gets derailed, uh, as a result of an economic downturn, it may take a while uh, to get those those resources back up. Um, the people who are in the business of doing it may not be in a position to do it moving forward. So uh, that is a real concern, something we need to be monitoring moving forward. Next on our list is growing food insecurity. Uh, this is an article from PBS. And by the way, I've, I've read a number of articles from different media sources. They are pretty much all saying the same thing, but I found this one to be uh, helpful because it uh, provides a lots of uh, information directly from people running food banks and uh, who, people who monitor uh, the activities of food banks nationwide. Headline, amid economic crisis, food banks are struggling to keep all the newly hungry fed. And by the way, if you go back and look at the video I did, I believe is on February 25th, we talked about all of this. We talked about this was going to happen should the pandemic uh, get speed and come to America uh, and be as uh, and have the impact that it has had uh, in China and in other countries. Folks, and I'm, I'm going off a little bit of a tangent here, but it's important for you to understand this, I think. The reason that people can accurately predict what is going to happen in a pandemic is because we have had pandemics in history and these have been studied and these have been written about. The fact that people are hitting up food banks because of a pandemic, um, yes, this, this was on the radar of a lot of folks. So this is not, this does not come as a surprise. It does not come as a surprise to the food bank folks, to their credit, because they have already, they started working on this weeks ago, wargaming this out, talking to their suppliers, talking to their donors, trying to figure out a path forward. So having said that, back to the article. Um, a quote here from Claire Babineau Fortnot. hope I said that correctly. Since the coronavirus outbreak began, food banks have seen demand increase by as much as 50% in some places. Uh, she is the CEO of Feeding America, the largest hunger relief organization in the U.S. Uh, since the corona, um, I've double quoted there. I apologize. It's late at night and I'm making the video. Our volunteers are inordinately elderly. These are volunteers at the food banks. Consequently, we have a bit of a perfect storm going on right now. 
We have an increase in demand, decrease in supply, supply of food, donations, and cash, and a significant decrease in our volunteer workforce. Some of that decrease in workforce is wanting us to look out for the safety of the people where they are trying to help us, and they are particularly vulnerable. Think about your typical volunteers at food banks or other charities. Many of these are retirees. Because they're retirees and because we're dealing with a pandemic, many of them have uh, adhere, are strictly adhering to shelter in place. Those volunteers who would be distributing the food are not there, and there's less food to be distributed because of decreased donations and increased supply. This is truly a perfect storm for the food bank network across the country. Dave Richens is the head of the United Food Bank in Mesa, Arizona. He reported that they are serving four times as many people as usual, like many states, enlisting the help of the National Guard to distribute food. I told someone tonight, I'm shocked it's only four times. I would have thought it's much higher. I've not checked with my local food bank here in Austin. Uh, I suspect they are seeing similar numbers. More and more people, people who have never been to a food bank in their lives, people who have never accepted any sort of charity for consumables food in their lives, are going to be turning to food banks moving forward for uh, some time to come. The risk of civil unrest. We have talked about this in 2019, uh, primarily in the context of you had all these uh, professors and, and scholars talking about um, the risk of a second American Civil War. And the fact, and I, if you recall from those videos, I was shocked that we were even talking about that because 10 years ago, we never would have discussed that. 15 years ago, for sure. We would never discussed civil unrest. I, I've never bought into this idea that we are facing a second American Civil War. However, there are some people and there are some studies that show that in times of high economic, uh, high unemployment and um, pandemic type of lockdowns that civil unrest can increase. The risk is directly related to the length of the lockdown, the stringency of the lockdown, as well as the unemployment rate. It is so critical that we keep food and essentials flowing and keep restrictions on people to a minimum to reduce the risk of civil unrest moving forward. Reason Magazine, pandemic related unemployment and shutdowns are a recipe for social unrest. Why would economic shutdowns lead to social unrest? Because commerce is the life's blood of a society. Jobs and businesses keep people alive. They represent the activities that meet demand for food, clothing, and shelter, and that develop and distribute the medicine and medical supplies we need to battle COVID-19. Folks, I've seen so many people on social media say things like, who cares about the economy? We just need to shut it down because we need to save lives. I beg of you to reconsider that position if, if you think that way. Uh, we have to have the economy so that we can buy food, that we can buy medicine, that we can get to work. Um, the economy is what sustains us. If those things do not take place, if everything shuts down, we truly become some sort of uh, dystopic society. Uh, we have to have the economy functioning and strong in order to bounce back from this and create the, the medications and create the solutions for the societal problems moving forward. Staying with that same article, quoting from uh, David Katz, I am deeply concerned that the social, economic, and public health consequences of this near total meltdown of more normal life, schools and businesses closed, gatherings banned, will be long-lasting and calamitous, possibly graver than the direct toll of the virus itself. He told the New York Times, the stock market will bounce back in time, but many businesses never will. The unemployment, impoverishment, and despair are likely to result will be public health scourges of the first order. I do not disagree with any of that. Um, this is going to have long lasting effects, even if the restrictions are removed uh, quickly sometime in late uh, April, if we're lucky, uh, maybe longer than that. But this is going to have a long term impact. And it is this meltdown he's talking about, which may increase the risk of civil unrest. Associated Press. Officers out there, officers are scared out there. Coronavirus hits U.S. police. Streets are less crowded as people hunker in, in their homes, but police must prepare for the possibility of civil unrest among people who become anxious or unhappy about government orders or hospitals that get overrun with patients. 
That was a summary of comments from former Boston Police Commissioner Ed Davis. Newsweek. And by the way, all these articles I'm linking to and discussing have been published in the last week. This is all relatively new news. This is not something from two years ago. Headline, inside the U.S. military's plans to stop civil disturbances amid coronavirus pandemic, something they haven't done in 30 years. With the National Guard now active in 22 states and governors continuing to declare more severe emergency measures daily, the U.S. military is preparing forces to assume a larger role in the coronavirus response, including the controversial mission of quelling civil disturbances and enforcing the law, a mission the military has not engaged in for almost 30 years. So paint the picture in your mind. People are without jobs. People have restrictions on their movement. The National Guard is patrolling the streets. Summer is coming. Tempers flare. It doesn't take a lot of imagination to come up with scenarios in your mind where things could de-escalate fairly rapidly. Same topic from Forbes magazine. History and psychology predict riots and protests amid coronavirus pandemic lockdowns. Now, obviously, we have to be concerned. <laughs> These clickbait sounding headlines. Uh, but at the same time, uh, there is some science behind this. There is some history behind this. And as people in the preparedness uh, community, we just need to be aware of this potential. Again, not saying this is going to happen, but we need to be aware of the possibility of it. Uh, quoting from the article, given that we are no longer facing down lions on a day-to-day -day basis, our survival triggers can be activated by things like being locked down, and they can be exacerbated by many of the factors that are present during a pandemic, such as lack of trust in government or authority, geographic proximity to others in a similar situation, and a shared purpose and intensity. That is to say, say riots are not a mindless mob as often depicted. And when we know that forced confinement triggers all, sides, all kinds of sensor responses that result in stress symptoms firing on all cylinders, lockdown should be a last resort. Yes, lockdown should be a last resort. And I forget what percentage of the population right now in the United States is under some form of a lockdown. Let's talk about the risk of increased crime. There is a bit of good news here. Uh, there are studies that are rather mixed in whether or not unemployment, increased unemployment, leads to more crime. Uh, there's one study that shows that at the height of the Great Depression that uh, the crime rate actually dropped by a third. Um, there are some other studies that show that there is some correlation between unemployment and the crime rate. I will link to an article that sort of outlines all of these uh, for your edification. Crimes that we would expect to increase, however, in these circumstances uh, are abuse. And we're already seeing stories here and there of increased spousal abuse, increased child abuse by the fact that everyone is being uh, confined to their homes. Scams centered around the pandemic, targeting primarily the elderly. Um, you know, buy your coronavirus test here or uh, get in line for this and pay me this money uh, to get ahead and get the right medication before everyone else does. There's lots of scams out there um, that uh, are preying upon vulnerable, pe vulnerable people. Those are sorts of things that uh, we would certainly expect to increase. But as we talked about earlier, as the temperatures go up and as the uncertainty increases, it could very well be that uh, people become irrational and do irrational things and in doing so, uh, decide they are going to hurt someone else either as part of a, a, a property crime or just uh, because they've snapped and, and they are in a bad place and they've decided they have to hurt someone uh, for whatever reason. I never like to leave these videos without giving us an action plan. So let's talk about that just for a couple of minutes. If food shortages and access to health care uh, start to become a problem, I think we should be prepared for first, second, and third order effects. The first order effect is obviously the fact that we may not be able to get the food we want. The second order effect is that uh, neighbors may feel that they aren't able to get the food they want, uh, and they may feel desperate, and they may act on that. And as a result of that, we would see police and National Guard stepping in 
uh, further curtailing civil liberties, further enforcing laws at checkpoints and being present, uh, these things tend to, to build on themselves. Uh, that's why it is so critical uh, that we, we do the things uh, that we can do to help one another uh, so that uh, we don't get into these situations. The probability of civil unrest is likely contingent upon the ability to access food and consumables, uh, the level of restrictions placed on people for extended periods of time, uh, the efficacy of law enforcement and the National Guard uh, to keep the peace. And, of course, we have a presidential election. Let's not forget that. Uh, as we head closer to the election and we start having uh, debates and political conventions, the level of political rhetoric, rhetoric uh, may uh, drive this if that gets uh, strong as well. We've, we've seen that before. The increase in crime may vary on location depending on how communities are doing and faring. Uh, if some communities do a better job of uh, of outreach through their churches and through their civic organizations and food banks, my guess is that those cities will probably see uh, a reduced risk of an increased crime rate uh, than those cities who, who struggle to figure out how to use the resources available to them uh, to meet the needs of citizens. Let's talk about a few things that you can do right now moving forward. First thing, keep tabs on the food stores that you keep at home and when you shop. Please do not misunderstand what I'm saying here. I am not telling you to run out and stock up on a bunch of food. What I am suggesting to you is, is that you keep tabs on what you have at home and you start to ask yourself if we have a shortage the next time I go to the grocery store, uh, if there's a shortage on chicken, uh, what would I be doing? What could I do for protein? A great source of information and a great way to create your game plan is paultmartin.com. Click on that Ready Citizen tab download the Ready Citizen Manual. I talk about your food planning options. I spend a lot of time talking about it. You'll see some guidance there on your food planning moving forward. The food planning section is four or five pages. You can knock it out, read it in three or four minutes, and quickly, quickly, quickly come up with a game plan if you have to pivot to a different type of food substance uh, in your diet because of some sort of disruption at your local grocery store. Just check that out. Uh, support your local food producers. If you have access uh, to uh, a farmer's market or some other CSA type uh, arrangement, uh, avail yourself of that. Let's support these people now who are uh, providing food and growing it locally. Monitor your social media accounts of, of local professional responders, police, fire, EMS. That is a great way to track on trends of what is happening in your community. Uh, it doesn't always get um, run through the, the media's uh, wash and their spin on things. Sometimes it's nice just to get the, the basic facts. And I find that local first responders do a good job when they post on social media, giving you uh, just the facts and giving you some flavor that, that you may miss if you just rely upon um, traditional news outlets. If you have a smartphone, download the radio uh, radio scanner app. Just go to your app store, however you buy your apps. Find, just search, do a search on radio scanner. There are lots of good radio scanners. Sometimes they're free, sometimes they're two or three bucks. Uh, save it to your phone. Uh, do a search on your local community. See what scanner feeds are available. A lot of times the police uh, scramble their feeds, and so you may not be able to get your local law enforcement feed. I have found that if you follow your local fire department, your local EMS, you will get pretty much the same amount of information, particularly the EMS. If something's going wrong, if there is some civil dis disobedience, I can assure you EMS is talking about it on their frequencies, and generally those are not scrambled. So get familiar with using those resources. Uh, get some practice at doing it. It's really easy to use, and it's a great source of information. As we are fond of saying, increase your situational awareness. Um, start paying more attention when you're out in public. Start paying more attention in your neighborhood to things that are going on. A friend of mine texted me tonight saying that they are noticing more and more people casing cars in their neighborhood, uh, that they're showing up on the, the ring doorbell systems and the security cameras that people have outside. Start paying attention to those sorts of things. Um, again, not necessarily saying it will happen, but when you increase your, uh, your situational awareness, you'll make better decisions moving forward. I will post an article uh, that Greg Elifritz uh, put up regarding uh, the use of pepper spray. Um, it is a great resource. Pepper spray is a great resource. I got certified to teach um, from Chuck Haggard his pepper spray course. 
Greg does a great job distilling a lot of that information into one article. If um, you are not inclined to carry a firearm for whatever reason, I highly recommend that you carry uh, OC. Uh, that is a spe specific type of, of spray. Read this article. It will quickly tell you what you need to do and how to use it. Um, big fan of Greg. He does a great job. Puts out a lot of great information on his website. Um, that's one of the websites I link to, in fact, on uh, the resource page of paultmartin.com. If you are licensed to carry holder, CHL holders, carry permit, whatever your state calls it, carry your firearm wherever you go. Again, we don't anticipate that we'll ever have to use it, but if it if it comes to a situation where things are getting out of hand, you're better off having it. Um, get in the habit of carrying your firearm. Support the organizations that feed people, uh, your local food banks, the, the, the shelters that take in abuse victims. This is a historic, historic time in our, our nation, folks. This isn't some uh, trend. This is, I mean, this is stuff that will historians will be talking about long after all of us are gone. This is, this is probably our centennial pandemic. We are living it right now. And how this turns out is large part a reflection upon what we do to take care of our families and what we do to take care of one another. Be as charitable as you can. I understand that the, you know, many people are without work. It's hard to be charitable. I get it. Reach out to people on their phones. Uh, text them, check on people. If you can support, if you can volunteer with any, some of these organizations, if you can donate blood, lots of things you can do right now to help uh, help your fellow citizen, um, people you may not even know. Get involved, do what you can to help others. And I, I know people aren't, not everyone is a person of faith, but if you are a person of faith, rest assured, I, I saw an article in Drudge Report today that more and more people are praying uh, than have done so in quite some time. So if you feel that the need to pray, rest assured you are not alone. Uh, I highly encourage you to do that. Uh, for those of you of the Christian faith, know that God is in control. God is good. He's going to use this as a way to make us all better uh, long term. I, I firmly believe that. And yes, it is rough for so many people, but we are going to come out of this. We have the potential to come out of this stronger better, better people, and better citizens and better Americans. So that's all I have for you tonight. Again, check out the website, paultmartin.com. Thanks for watching, and as always, God bless America.